One day, a month or so later, Montague, to his great surprise, received a letter from Stanley Ryder. Could you make it convenient to call at my office sometime this afternoon? Read, I wish to talk over with you a business proposition which I believe you will find of great advantage to yourself. I suppose he wants to, f to buy me buy my northern Mississippi stock, he said to himself as he called up Ryder on the phone and made an appointment. This was the first time he had ever been inside the building of the Gotham Trust Company, and he gazed about and gazed about him at the overwhelming magnificence, huge gates of bronze and walls of exquisite marble. Ryder's own office was elaborate and splendid, and he himself was a picture of aristocratic elegance. He greeted Montague cordially and talked for a few minutes about the state of the market and the business situation, in the meantime twirling a pencil in his hand and watching his visitor narrowly. At last he began, Mr. Montague, I have for some time been working over a plan which I think will interest you. I shall be very pleased to hear of it, said Montague. Of course you know, said Ryder, that I bought from Mrs. Taylor her holdings in the Northern Mississippi Railroad. I bought them because I was of the opinion that the road ought to be developed, and I believed that I could induce someone to take the matter up. I have found the right parties, I think, and the plans are now being worked out. Indeed, said the other, with interest, the idea, Mr. Montague, is to extend the, the railroad according to the old plan, which you are familiar. Before we took the matter up, we approached the holders of the major of the stock, most of whom, I suppose, are known to you made them through our agents a proposition to buy their stock at what we considered a fair price, and we have purchased about 5,000 shares additional. The prices quoted on the balance were more than we cared to pay in consideration of the great cost of the improvements we proposed to undertake. Our idea is now to make a new proposition to these other shareholders. The annual stockholders meeting takes place next month. At this meeting, we will be brought up the project for the issue of 20,000 additional shares with the understanding that as much of this new stock is, as is not taken by the present shareholders is to go to us. I, as I assume that few of them will take their allotments that will give us control of the road, you can understand, of course, that our syndicate would not undertake the venture unless it could obtain control. Want to give not is assent to this. At this meeting, Ryder, said Ryder, we shall propose a ticket of our own for the new board of directors. We are in hopes that as our proposition will be in the interest of every stockholder, this ticket will be elected. We believe that the roads need a new policy and a new management entirely. If not a majority of the stockholders can be brought to our point of view, we shall take control and put in a new president. Ryder paused for a moment to let this information sink into his auditor's mind. Then, fixing his gaze upon him narrowly, he continued, What I w wish to see about you, Mr. Montague, was to make you a proposal to assist us in putting through this project. We should like you, in the first place, to act as our representative in con consultation with our regular attorneys. We should like you, you to interview the, privately the stockholders of the road and explain to them our projects and vouch for our good intentions. We can see your way to undertake this work for us. We should be glad to place you upon the proposed board of directors and as we have matters in our hands we should ask you to become president of the road. Montague gave an inward start but practice Taught, had taught him to keep from letting his surprise manifest itself very much. We sat for a minute in thought. Mr. Ryder, he said, I am a little surprised at such a, a proposition from you, seeing that you now know so little about me. I know more than you suppose, Mr. Montague, said the other, with a smile, 
you may rest assured that I am not broached such a matter to you without making inquiries and satisfying myself that you were the proper person. This is very pleasant to be told that, said Montague, but I must remind you also that I am not a railroad man and have had no experience whatever in such matters. It is not necessary that you should be a railroad man, was the answer. One can hire talent of that kind at market prices. What we wish is a man of careful and conservative temper, and above all, a man of thoroughly thoroughgoing honesty, someone who will be capable of winning the confidence of the stockholders and of keeping it. It seemed to us that you possessed these qualifications. Also, of course, you have the advantage of being familiar with the neighborhood and of knowing thoroughly the, the local conditions. Montague thought for a while longer. The offer is a very flattering one, and I need hardly to tell you that it interests me. But before I could con properly consider the matter, there is one thing I should have to know. That is, who are the members of the syndicate? Why would it be necessary to know that, asked the other? Because I am to lend my reputation to their project, and I should know, should have the, to know the character of the men that I was dealing with. Montague was gazing straight into the other's eyes. Of course, well, uh, you will understand, of course, at, replied uh, Ryder, that in a matter of this sort it is necessary to proceed with caution. We cannot afford to talk about what we are going to do. We have enemies who will do what they can to check us at every step. Whatever you tell me will, of course, be confidential, said Montague. I understand that perfectly well, was the reply. But I wish first to get some idea of your attitude towards the project, whether or not you would be at liberty to take up this work and to devote yourself to it. I can see no reason why I should not, Montague answered. It seems to me, said Ryder, that the proposition can be judged largely on its own merits. It is a proposition to put through an important public improvement road which is in a broken down and practically bankrupt condition is to be taken up, thoroughly reorganized and put on, upon its feet. It is to have a vigorous and honest administration and new inadequate equipment in a new source of traffic. Business of the Mississippi Steel Company, as you doubtless know, is growing with extraordinary rapidity. All this, it seems to me, is a work about the advisability of which there can be no question. That is very true, said Montague, and I will meet the persons who are interested and talk out matters with them, and if their plans are such I can approve, I should be very glad to join with them and to do everything in my power to make a success of the enterprise. As you doubtless know, I have 500 shares of the stock myself and I should be glad to become a member of the syndicate. That is what I had in mind to propose to you, said the other. I anticipate no difficulty in satisfying you. The project is largely of my own originating and my own reputation will be behind it. The Gotham Trust Company will lend its credit to the enterprise so far as, up, as possible. Ryder said this with the, just a trifle of hauteur, and Montague felt that perhaps he had spoken too strenuously. No one could sit in Ryder's office and not be impressed by its atmosphere of magnificence. After all, it was here it, in its 70 or 80 million dollars of deposits were real, and this serene and aristocratic gentleman was the master of them. And what reason had Montague for his hesitation except for the gossip of idle and cynical society people? Whatever doubts he himself might have, he needed to reflect but a moment to realize that his friends in Mississippi would not share them. If he went back home and with the name of Stanley Ryder and the Gotham Trust Company back to him, he would come as a conqueror with tidings of triumph and all the old friends of the family would rush to follow his suggestions. Ryder waited a while, perhaps to let these reflections sink in. He finally continued, I presume, Mr. Montague, that you know something about the Mississippi Steel Company. The steel situation is a peculiar one. Stock, oh, prices are 
kept at an altogether artificial level and there is room for large profits to, to competitors of the trust. But those who go to, into business commonly find themselves unexpectedly handicapped. They cannot get the credit they want. Orders overwhelm them in floods. But Wall Street will not put up money to help them. They find all kinds of powerful interest arrayed against them. There are raids upon their securities in the, in the market, and the mysterious rumors begin to circulate. They find suits brought against them which tend to injure their credit, and sometimes they will find important papers missing, important witnesses sailing for Europe, and so on. And their most efficient employees will be brought up their very bookkeepers and office boys will be bribed and all the secrets of their business passed on to their enemies. They will find that the railroads do not treat them squarely, cars will be slowing in coming, and all kinds of petty annoyances will be practiced. You know what the, the rebate is, and you know and you can imagine the part which that plays. In these and a hundred other ways, the path of, of the independent steel manufacturer is made difficult. And now, Mr. Montague, this is a project to extend a railroad which will be of vast service to the chief competitor of the Steel Trust. I believe you, that you are a man of the world enough to realize that this improvement would have made been made long ago if the Steel Trust had not been able to prevent it. And now the time has come when that project is to be put through in spite of every opposition that the trust can bring. And I have come to you because I believe that you are a man to be counted on in such a fight. I understand you, said Montague softly, and you are right in your supposition. Very well, Ryder, said Ryder. Then I will tell you that the syndicate of which I speak is composed of John, of myself and John S. Price, who has recently acquired control of the Mississippi Steel Company. You will find out, without permission, what Price's pop reputation is, and he is the one man in the country who has made any real headway against the trust. The business of the Mississippi Company has almost doubled in the past year, and there is no limit to what it can do except the size of the plant and the ability of the railroads to handle its product. This new plan would have been taken up through the company, but for the fact that the company's capital and credit is in, involved in elaborate extensions. Price has furnished some of the capital personally, and I have raised the balance. And what we want now is an honest man to whom we can entrust this most important project, a man who will take the road in hand and put it on its feet and make it of service, some service in the community. You are the man we have selected, and if the proposition appeals to you, why, we are ready to do business with you without delay. A minute or two, a minute or two, Montague was silent, then he said, I appreciate your confidence, Mr. Ryder, and what you say appeals to me, but the matter is very important to uh, one to me, as you can readily understand, and so I will ask you to give me until tomorrow to make up my mind. Very well, said Ryder. Montague's first thought was of General Prentice. Come to me any time you need advice, the general had said. So Montague went down to his office. Do you know anything about John S. Price? he asked. I don't know him very well personally, was the reply. I know him by reputation. He, he is a daring Wall Street operator and he's been very successful, I am told. The price began life as a cowboy, I understand, continued the general after a pause. Then he went in for mines. Ten or fifteen years ago, we used to know him as a silver man. Several years ago, there was a report that he had been raiding Mississippi Steel and got control. That was rather startling news, for everyone knew that the trust was after it. He seems to have fought them to a standstill. That sounds interesting, said Montague. Uh, Price is brought up in a, a rough school, the general, said the general with a smile. He has a tongue like a whiplash. I remember once I attended a creditor's meeting of the American Stove Company, which had gotten into trouble, and Price 
started off from the word go. Mr. Chairman, you said, when I come into the office of an industrial corporation and see a stock ticker behind the president's chair with the carpet worn threadbare in front of it, I know what's the matter with the, that corporation without asking another word. What do you what do you want to know about him for, as the general, after we got through laughing over this recollection? It's a case I'm interested in, the other answered. I tell you who knows about him, said the general. Harry Curtis, William E. Davins, and has done law business for Price. Is that so? said Montague. Then I probably shall meet Harry. I can tell you a better person yet, said the other after a moment's thought. Ask your friend Mrs. Alden. She knows Price intimately, I believe. So Montague set up, sent up a note to Mrs. Billy and the reply came, uh, come to dinner. I am not going to going out. And so late in the afternoon, he was ensconced in a big leather armchair in Mrs. Billy's private drawing room, listening to an account of the owner of the Mississippi Steel Company. Johnny Price, said the great lady, I am, I know, yes, I know him. It all depends on whether you are going to have him for a friend or an enemy. His mother was Irish, and he is built after her. If he happens to take a fancy to you, he'll die for you. And if you make him hate you, he will hear a greater variety of epithets than you will ever suppose the language contained. I first met him in Washington, and Mrs. Billy went on reminiscently. Uh, that was 15 years ago, when my brother was in Congress. I think I told you once how Davy paid $40,000 for the nomination, and he went to Congress. It was the year of a Democratic landslide, and they could have elected Reggie Mon if they had felt like it. I, I went to Washington to live the next winter, and Price was there f with a whole army of lobbyists fighting for free silver. That was before the craze, you know, when silver was respectable and Price was the silver king. I saw the inside of government, American government that winter, I can assure you. Tell me about it, said Montague. The Democratic Party has been elected on a low-tariff platform, said Ms. Billy, and it sold out bag and baggage to the corporations. Money was as free as water. My brother could have gotten his 40000 back three times over. It was the steel crowd that bossed the job. You know, the William Roberts used to come down from Pittsburgh every two or three days, and he had a private phone, telephone wire the rest of the time. I have always said it was the Steel Trust clamped the tariff swindle on the American people, and that's held it there ever since. What did Price do with his silver mines? asked Montague. He stole them, said she, and just in the nick of time. He was on the inside of the campaign of 96, and I remember one night he came to dinner at our house and told us that the Republican Party had raised 10 or 15 million dollars to buy the election. That's the end of silver, he said, and he sold out that very month and he's been freelancing in, in Wall Street ever since. Have you met him yet? asked Mrs. Billy after a pause. Not yet, he answered. He's a character, she said. I've heard Davy tell about the first time he struck New York as a miner with a huge wad of greenbacks in his pocket. He spent his money like a coal oil johnny, as the phrase is, a hundred dollar bill for a shine and that sort of thing. And he'd go on to the wild deba wildest debauches. You can have no idea of it. You see, that kind of man, said Montague, he used to be, said the other. But one day he had something the matter with him and he went to the, the, a doctor, and the doctor told him something, and I, I don't know what, and he shut down like a steel trap. Now, he never drinks a drop, and he lives on one meal a day and a cup of coffee. But he still goes on with the old crowd. I don't believe there is a politician or a sporting man in town that Johnny Price does not know. He sits in their haunts and talks with them until all 
sorts of hours in the morning, but I can never get him to come to my dinner parties. My people are human, he will say. Yours are sawdust. Sometimes, if you want to see New York, just get Johnny Price to take you about and introduce you to his bookmakers and burglars. Want to get mediated for a while over his friend's picture. Somehow or other, he said, it doesn't take, it doesn't sound much like the president of a million, hundred million dollar corporation. That's all right, Mrs. Billy said, but Price will be at his desk bright and early the next morning, and every man in the office will be there too. And if you think that he won't have his wits about him, just you try to fool him on some deal and see. Let me tell you a little that I know about the fight he has made with Mississippi Steel Company. And she went on to tell. The upshot of her telling was that Montague borrowed the use of her desk and wrote a note to Stanley Ryder. From the inquiries about John S. Price, I gather he, that he makes steel. With the understanding that I am to make a railroad and carry his steel, I have concluded to accept your proposition subject, of course, to a satisfactory arrangement as to terms.